Welcome to IELTS TV's Israel Daily. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and coming up in today's newscast, ousted former president of Egypt Hosni Mubarak passes away. Israel and other world nations do their part to save humanity from the apocalypse. And finally, stay tuned to find out who's going to be hosting this year at the annual Genesis Prize. Now, shocking news has fallen on the Middle East. The iconic former president of Egypt has died. ואנחנו נמשיך ללכת בדרך המשותפת הזאת. אני מבקש לשלוח את הנכונים לנשיא סיסי, למשפחת מובארק ולעם המצרי. Former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak has passed away at the age of 91. He had been in intensive care for a few weeks following surgery, but while statesmen like Prime Minister Netanyahu all over the world are sharing their condolences, the former Egyptian leader leaves a controversial legacy behind him. He was a commander in the Egyptian Air Forces and then Vice President to Anwar Sadat, only to take his place in 1981 when Sadat was assassinated. Then as President, he was known for being a strong U.S. ally and opponent of militant Islam. But he was also known for greatly expanding his powers, arresting political opponents and enforcing harsh punishments against dissenters. And this is what eventually led to his downfall. Mubarak was removed from office after 30 years in power in the midst of the Arab Spring of 2011. And he was sentenced to life in prison following the popular protests against him, in which nearly 900 civilians were killed. But in 2017, his appeals were upheld. And he was both released and cleared of most charges, including inciting the killings. Still, older Egyptians look back on his years quite fondly. <laughs> كان رئيس بجد قوي جدا ومخلي الشعب المصري ليه كيان بجد في كل الدول وليه ذكريات سيئة حاجات يعني بسببها يعني خاص خاصة الشركات بجد القطاع العام والمرض اللي انتشر بطريقة غير طبيعية في عهد والفساد الغير طبيعي اللي حصل فالأسف هو ذكريات فعلا هي اللي أثرت عليه and as far as regional peace with Israel is concerned, it is true that he largely preserved his predecessor's policies, including the historic Camp David Accords. Well, the final stretch of the latest Israeli campaign season is here, but all anyone can think of is coronavirus. In fact, even Prime Minister Netanyahu has stopped shaking hands over fear of contracting the disease. The final stretch of the latest Israeli campaign season is here, but all anyone can think of is coronavirus. In fact, even Prime Minister Netanyahu has stopped shaking hands over fear of contracting the disease. In a visit to the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron, the Likud leader is filmed refusing to outstretch his hand, while an aide whispers, no handshakes. And other officials with the Prime Minister's office confirm that this decision is responsible, as Netanyahu meets thousands of people every day. Meanwhile, in another responsible decision, Netanyahu is chairing discussions on Israel's economic readiness for coronavirus's consequences. Essentially, the new committee will be responsible for meeting daily and monitoring the trends related to Israel. It will then inform the government and the public as necessary of any changes. And the committee is comprised of representatives from Israeli banks, the finance ministry, and the National Security Council. But so far, what's the damage? Well, the Ministry of Finance expects a likely annual hit to the GDP of 0.25 to 1%. The Bank of Israel, on the other hand, says that if the disease both spreads and persists in the region, Israel's GDP in 2020 could be cut by nearly 3%, or $12.5 billion. 
All right. Now, we've been speaking a lot about the Likud and Blue and White parties because they're the biggest and have the most impact. But let's not forget that there are at least six other parties that will likely make it into the Knesset. So here to help us focus on them, we're joined by Israeli attorney and legal advisor to the Israeli Movement for Governability and Democracy, Simcha Rotman. Hi. Thank you for joining us. So we have four days left before the vote. And all things considered, uh, everything's pretty calm and quiet. Why do you think that's the case? Um... I'm not sure everything is, is calm. I'm, the, the parties now focus their campaigns on, I would say, door-to-door -door campaign. People are meeting almost every evening, every, every day. We you drive hundreds of kilometers a day, all the candidates, and go and talk to the public. We used to have two campaigns that were mostly focused on social media, and on, on general media, right. uh, so so we got a lot of noise. Now it's Maybe a lot it's of the under the surface. Maybe just the feeling that there's nothing new really coming out because we've been through this three times within the past yes, year. Yes, and right? many many people think that we're going to have a force. So. Right, which is just uh, yeah. Let's not even think about that. But let's talk a little bit about uh, you know the right wing politicians right now. Apart from Bennett, we haven't really been hearing from anybody else on the right, uh, like Rafi Peretz, Ayelet Shaked, and, and Bezalel Smotrich. Where, where are they? Um, I think Bezalel Bet Smotrich speaks quite a lot. Uh, it was just yesterday was in, a, in, a, in an event, and he is, speaks a lot. Ayelet Shaked also. Rafi Peretz, I think they're hiding him, and, and they have some good reasons for that. But, uh, but I think that Bezalel Smotrich and Ayelet Shaked and Naftali Bennett are the spokespersons of the campaign, they talk a lot, they interview a lot, they right. tweet a lot. Rafi Peretz, not so much. Now, you mentioned this, but it's highly likely, based on the polls, that we will go to fourth elections. Is there any chance that Rivlin will do anything to prevent this from happening? Can he do anything right now? It's not up to him. If, you, if, if no one can get a majority, you don't really have to, need to have 61, but you must, have, you, you must not have 61 right. against you. If no one has majority, there will be no government. Doesn't matter well, what Riven wants to do. Is this going to just keep on do. continuing over and over again? Until because something would break. Again, Blue and White can break, Lieberman can break, the Likud can break. Um, chances are that if there will be some kind of a split, it will happen either in the Blue and White party or the Likud, just because the chances for that are higher, right. um, but also it can Although be... Although the parties seem to be sticking together pretty strongly. Now, my question is, is there a, a chance for any type of unity between Blue and White and Likud, or is that just out of the question at this point? Blue and White says loud and clear they don't want any right. unity and, until Netanyahu is not the head of the Likud. The Likud, I have to say, if the Netanyahu won't be the head of the Likud, chances that someone else in the Likud will break the bond with the ultra-Orthodox and the right-wing parties are slim to non-existent. So because Netanyahu, Netanyahu is, is the only one that can go uh, to unity so. government with blue and white and, and live another day in the, politic, uh, uh, in the politics of Israel. Right. No one else in the Likud can do that, so that's why we are in the deadlock. All right. Um, well, we're going to have to see how this plays out again, right? Thank you for joining hopefully. us, Simcha. All right. Now, in what appears to be another push for votes, Prime Minister Netanyahu says he is moving forward with decades-old plans to construct around 3,500 homes in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank. <laughs> The E1 area covers about four and a half square miles between Jerusalem and the Israeli settlement of Male Adumi, and it's technically in Area C, meaning it's governed by Israel and will likely remain Israeli in any future peace agreement. But this is still some seriously touchy real estate, coveted both by the Palestinians and the Israelis. That's why plans to build in the region have been frozen for so long. But not anymore, says Prime Minister Netanyahu in a speech in Malé Adumi. And in fact, Netanyahu is also confirming the tender for another 1,000 homes in the Jewish East Jerusalem neighborhood of Givat Hamatos. There's a battle for Jerusalem. The purpose of this visit is to uh, point out that the uh, Prime Minister Sharon has been 
is frozen the ability to build the connection between Jerusalem and Maaleh Dumim and create thereby Greater Jerusalem. Sharon will build here, I will. Now, it's true. These building plans had been conceived by Yitzhak Rabin back in 1995. And again, they're in Area C of the region. The plans have been frozen since at least 2009 over disputes with the Palestinian Authority. While Israel sees this region as a greater Jerusalem to be unified under Israeli sovereignty, the PA sees this region as essential to building a future state and therefore rejects any Israeli presence. Dangerous uh, policy and uh, we consider this an act of uh, destroying the peace process. Well, in related news, the United States West Bank mapping team is on its way to Israel to begin scouting areas that Israel may annex as part of the White House's so-called deal of the century. However, in spite of the project's launch, the U.S. says Israel must hold off on any annexations, at least for the time being. Washington wants to give the committee ample time to conclude its work that can take weeks or even months to complete. And the U.S. wants to give time to the Palestinian Authority to come to the table and join the conversation. But still, Israeli officials have been vowing to extend sovereignty to the settlements, regardless of the PA's participation. So perhaps to that end, with less than a week until elections, Prime Minister Netanyahu is ordering at least 12 illegal outposts be hooked up to the power grid. And the Prime Minister's office also says it's in the process of legalizing many of the over 100 outposts scattered across Judea and Samaria or the West Bank region. Now, the American delegation includes U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman, his advisor, and the U.S. National Security Council's senior advisor for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel, in turn, will be matching these committee members with Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Ron Dermer, acting director for the Prime Minister's office, Ronen Peretz, and Likud Minister Yariv Levin. All right, now we recently discussed how the Belgian city of Alst is coming under fire for featuring offensive caricatures of Orthodox Jews in its annual carnival. But this story is just one example of ongoing anti-Semitic incidents that seem to be increasing enormously in not only Europe, but across the world. Well, joining us now in the studio is Eliyahu Roth, the founder and director of the Online Anti-Semitism Task Force, to talk to us about how his initiative is working to combat hate. All right, so first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, because from what I understand, you were Christian, living in Europe, and now you live in Judea and Samaria. Yes. And so, you were Jewish. Yes, so I was born as a Christian in Belgium, in Molenbeek, for who knows. And um, I, uh, I grew up in a Christian family. I go to live in Saudi Arabia with my father uh, when I was 12. I'm coming from a special family. Half of my grandparents were collaborating with the Nazi, half of my grandparents were fighting the Nazi. Then, uh, believe in God, looking for, uh, for something, and uh, I converted to Judaism when I was 29, go to learn in a yeshiva. Wow. And, um, wow, what, what, what sparked that change? That's a long conversation. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, some common sense, some logic, some reading of the, of the books of everyone, and um, I arrive here like a... All right, so talk to us a little bit about how this conversion and this eventual move to Israel shaped what you do today. You have the, uh, the online anti-Semitism task force. What do you do? It's coming from a story. When I was learning in the yeshiva, a friend of mine wanted to know what I'm doing, a non-Jewish friend of mine. So I told him that I'm learning the Talmud. Same day in the evening, he called me back. He told me, what are you learning? I said, what is the problem? He said, Google it. So I Googled it. Seven of the first 10 answers uh, were linking to anti-Semitic content. <coughs> meaning uh, Jews are taking the blood of the Christian children right. and everything. So uh, I decided that something has to be done. A uh, few years later, I created this initiative uh, to have people monitoring internet, uh, removing content from the, from the internet. and uh, Right. So any type of anti-Semitic content that you guys find online, you make it your mission to get it taken down. And that's you know, uh, collaborating with Facebook, Twitter, you name it, right? Yes. Now, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in terms of the online hate that spread? There is a few main trends. So the classic anti-Semitism connected to neo-Nazi and far-right. This is the old anti-Semitism as we know it. We see it massively, main, mostly in English. Um, there is the leftist anti-Semitism that is more connected to BDS movement. And uh, there is a global anti-Semitism that we see a lot in the Arab countries that is terror incitement, as we saw uh, in the Facebook Intifada, very connected to old anti-Semitism also. So uh, right. we have all the world. Uh, wow. So, so I guess my question is, for those of us who don't necessarily have the task force that you have, but we see this stuff online, how can we contribute to getting that taken down? 
First of all, you need to report it. Uh, don't stand still. You see something in the street, you act. So you see something on the internet, you act. There is reporting tools. Uh, and there is organization, Jewish organization, that are uh, there to help. So you have something, you show it to us. We're going to make our work to make it, uh, to have it removed. Right. And, and I guess, I mean, why would you say that it's so important to tackle online racism versus, you know, real world incidents? Because I'm a 45 years old guy. I born in Europe. It was already some kind of anti-Semitic, but it was contained. Today, all of these people that were talking anti-Semitism years ago in their basement, in their cave, today they're out. This is the web today. Everyone right. can talk. So, uh, and then you have common sense, what people are going to choose, uh, going That's to choose hate. Or, uh, so it's a circle. Uh, we need to know what's happening. We need to understand who's behind this. And this is our work to try to understand who's behind it and uh, educate uh, social media, governments, Wow, it's very impressive what you're doing, and I think that's a very good point, that just the fact that, you know, what was hidden before can now be seen online, whether or not it's anonymous, right? So that's important to keep in mind. Thank you so much for joining us, and My congratulations pleasure. on the work that you're doing. Thank you. All right, now, if a major catastrophe hits our planet, how can we ensure that survivors never go hungry? Well, the answer is in the doomsday vault in Norway, and ILTV's Nittany Manson has the story. Check this out. It's from Israel. Seeds from onions from Brazil. Wild emmer wheat seeds from Haifa University in Israel. These are just some of the seeds stashed in the famous Doomsday Vault. It's a massive safety deposit box in Norway that has hundreds of thousands of seeds stashed away in case of a world emergency. And this week, it received its one millionth deposit. The Svilbard Global Seed Vault was built deep within a mountainside on the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen in 2008 and it's opened only a few times a year to preserve the seeds inside. On Tuesday, 30 gene banks deposited seeds from countries across the world, like India, Mali, and Peru. The vault is on a mission to safeguard the DNA of the world's crop in order to ensure that there's diversity of species and enough to eat if the world as we know it comes to an end anytime soon. It's artificially cooled to negative 18 degrees Celsius to preserve the seeds, but the rock and the permafrost surrounding it are supposed to keep them frozen, even if the power goes out. And the good news is that climate change has already tested how impenetrable the vault truly is. Back in 2018, melting permafrost found its way inside the access tunnel to the vault, but luckily the water froze inside before the vault was breached. Since then, Norway has committed around 10 million euros to make the vault more fail-safe. All right, it's time to learn about some must-see places to visit here in the Holy Land that even Israelis don't always know about. They're brought to you by Visit to Israel, and joining us is Uli Mol, owner and tour guide with the Let's Tour Israel travel agency. All right, so what is up first, my friend? First, we're going to go back to Jerusalem. We're going to visit the Tower of David. Ooh, the Tower of David. Tower of David is actually a citadel with a beautiful inner courtyard. Um, used for music festivals, and it's also a museum in which you can go in and follow the development or the history of Jerusalem period by period. It hosts amazing events. And whoever ruled Jerusalem ruled from there. King Herod built it, and then the, the Ottomans were there, the Mamluks were there, the Crusaders were there. You know who was not there? Who was not King there? King David. Really? Yeah, okay. it actually did not exist in his time. But Interesting. The, so why is it called the Tower of David then? Because David is a good thing to brand things in Jerusalem. You know, City of David, Tower yeah, of David. Yeah, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. It's a good branding mechanism. It is. It's but, the but something of David. So you're saying that most of the, the biggest leaders of all time actually resided in yeah, this area. Yeah, because it overlooks the old city. So if you right. want to control the city, this is the best way. This right. is why King Harold built it. And then wow. whoever conquered Jerusalem used it after him. Today, it's just a really cool place just to walk around in. Yeah, Even if I you're mean, not it's super impressive. I've been there multiple times, and I, it's, it's a must-see. It's just a must-see location. It is. And by, by the way, sometimes in the evenings, there's a light, uh, light show. Oh, right. Which Don't is miss the light show. Yep. All right, what's up next? Kerem Hateimani. Kerem Hateimani. Yeah, the Yamini Vineyard, if you translate yes. it. It's an old neighborhood in Tel Aviv, which is actually older than Tel Aviv. It was right. just there as Tel Aviv started developing and developed all around. And today, it's one of the ways best places to see Tel Aviv, old school Tel Aviv. Yeah. Short buildings with 
like small authentic eateries. Right, and that's actually where the Shuka Carmel, the big exactly. uh, Carmel market it, it is, right? Exactly, the Shuka Carmel. Which is just, you, know, you have to go there if you come to Tel Aviv. Of course, it's a yeah. really fun market. It's overgoing a, some kind of a gentrification in the last yeah, few years, that's true. and now you find a lot of really cool small boutique restaurants and a lot of bars, so it's a really cool place to do. Oh, some of the best food in all of Israel is in Kemal Tehwa anyway. I'm telling you guys, it is. It is. you have to visit. I actually live right around the corner. Me so too. So every Friday I spend my time in Kemal Tehwa I just It's my favorite area of Tel Aviv. I agree. I agree. It's a really cool place. If you're looking for a place to stay in Tel Aviv, if you're coming, that's the best place to look for an Airbnb or something. All right. That's the best piece of advice you've given today. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Way. Have a great day. All right. Now, Israelis may be sick and tired of heading to the polls now that Israel is about to head to its third election in less than a year. But there is one positive that has come out of it. A new Ben & Jerry's ice cream flavor. That's right, Ben & Jerry's Israel is giving Israelis another reason to vote. They've created a flavor called One Sweet Vote after asking their fans what ingredients they would want inside the ice cream. And are you ready to hear what delicious concoction they've come up with? One Sweet Vote is a vanilla ice cream filled with peace symbol-shaped chocolates and chocolate-covered almonds. It also has a mix of chocolate ice cream packed with white chocolate chunks and pieces of blondie brownies. Basically, it's an explosion of everything you would ever want in your tub of ice cream. The ingredients are a bit different than what some Israelis said they wanted, though. Suggestions ranged from za'atar spice ice cream to a bamba-flavored ice cream. And one person even suggested something that leaves a bitter taste at the end. All right, I don't know about you guys, but I know exactly what I am doing after I vote on Monday. I am stuffing my face with the tub of this ice cream. That is the plan. All right, moving on. Steven Spielberg's daughter, Michaela, is making headlines. And it's not because she's following her father's path as a legendary film director. Rather, the 23-year-old has announced her decision to pursue a career in porn. Yes, that's right. Michaela Spielberg says she's already working as a porn star. And no, it's not a, quote, end-of-the-road decision or a I've hit bottom choice. She says it's an empowering and positive one and that she has no shame in having a fascination with the porn industry and wanting to do something that is safe, sane, and consensual. Well, Michaela was adopted as an infant by Spielberg and his wife, actress Kate Capshaw. And today she's reportedly engaged to a man that's twice her age, which is why she performs by herself as not to violate her relationship with her fiancé. But how have her parents reacted? I'm sure you're wondering. Well, an unnamed family friend told the tabloid Page Six that Spielberg and his wife have, quote, always been supportive of Michaela and try to understand her, even though they're a bit embarrassed by her sudden public admission of entry into the sex worker world. All right, speaking of entertainment, up now on the entertainment rundown, you'll never guess which Hollywood celebs are set to return to Israel to host this year's Genesis Prize Ceremony. ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is, of course, here with the details. Hello. Hey, Natasha. So the Genesis Prize Foundation announced that the co-hosts of this year's ceremony are power couple Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Now, the two are set to return to the Holy Land for the June 18th event. This is some exciting news. I didn't... Did Michael Douglas actually win the award a few years That's ago? That's right. Uh, the 75-year-old icon won the prestigious $1 million prize back in 2015, and Douglas directed his award towards projects that promote diversity and include inclusiveness in the Jewish world. But for those who don't know, the prize is meant to recognize the professional achievements, contributions to humanity, and commitment to Jewish values and Israel. It's meant to inspire Jewish pride and works on strengthening the bond between Israel and the diaspora. Yeah, it's an annual award that really celebrates Jewish talent and honors right. people for working on improving the world in one way or another. Now, who will this year's award be honoring? So this year, the gala ceremony is going to honor human rights activist and Jewish hero Natan Sharansky and will take place at the International Convention Center in Jerusalem this June. Now, the power couple made a statement saying, quote, Catherine and I look forward to returning to Israel, a country our family, our entire family loves so much. He went on to say that this trip would also be a way for his family to honor the memory of his late father, Kirk Douglas, who died earlier this month at the age of 103. Well, yeah, Kirk Douglas was such an iconic Hollywood figure. He was such a prominent actor in the golden age of Hollywood. And what I always found so interesting is that he reconnected with his Jewish roots only in his later years. Right. But he's always had such a strong connection to Israel. Yeah, and I also, I also think it's super amazing that the two are coming to co-host this year's ceremony. And I actually read somewhere that the Genesis Foundation plans on holding a special event to honor Kirk Douglas during, his, during uh, Michael Douglas's visit. Interesting. All right, so it's going to be extra special. Manuel, thanks for the update. Of course.
All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be cloudy with some scattered showers and lows of about 48 or 8 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow should be cloudy again, but with a slight rise in temperatures to an average high of 70 or 21 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what is going viral in Israel on tubing. Can I? Uh, everything about this video is perfect. A dog with a pancake on his face and his Russian mother telling him to eat it already. Oh, all right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.44 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILE TV, please follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roko TV pages. I'm Natasha Kierczek, and thanks for watching.